What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and today it's time for a $1,000 RTX 3060 Ti gaming PC build. I'm super duper excited for this system. The performance is absolutely killer but we're going to test it out later in around about 15 of the most popular AAA titles. So buckle in, make sure to get subscribed if you aren't already but let's dive into it. But first a quick word from today's video sponsor. AlphaSync's custom gaming PCs are built by eBuyer.com's in-house experts. And what's more, they've got a range of RTX 3000 series systems featuring the new 3060 Ti cards available to buy. Head to the first link in the description below where all the parts are sourced from the most trustworthy and innovative manufacturers. And with free next day delivery, you can get your RTX 3000 game on now. Check them out at the first link in the description below. As always, I'm going to kick things off by installing as many many components into our motherboard today as is possible before we go ahead and move this into our case and then got onto the graphics card a little bit later. This board is from Gigabyte and it's their B550M Gaming. They do various budget B550 options which I'll link alongside all the parts today in the description below. Into the motherboard I'm going to install our CPU choice. Specifically this is the Ryzen 5 3600. The new 5600X is great but at about 130 $30 more expensive than this CPU, this is the best option today in my opinion. We're going to line the golden triangle on the corner of our CPU with the top left corner of our CPU socket, pulling up the retention arm and nice and easily dropping the CPU into place today. Next up today is our CPU cooler. I've opted to stick with the AMD stock cooler that comes for free in the box of the CPU and this is going to do a more than adequate job of keeping it nice and cool. Typically it will come with pre-applied thermal paste but because I've used this before, I just need to add in a little drop of my own. The cooler is then just going to sit on the stock mounting hardware and be tightened corner by corner. Try and do this uh, in a kind of a cross pattern to make sure all the screws are evenly tight. And then finally take this four pin CPU fan cable, plug that up to the little gray header on your motherboard, tuck the cable nicely away and we can move on to our RAM today. <laughs> this is a 16 gigabyte kit of Adata Spectrix D60G with a 3600 megahertz clock speed. It's going to be nice and quick for our Ryzen CPU today. Installing the RAM is pretty easy. Pull back all clips uh, on this motherboard because there's only two slots and then line up the notch on your RAM with the corresponding notches on your motherboard dim slots. Do this for as many RAM dims as you've got and these things are going to light up like Christmas trees as you'll see a little bit later. Finally then, can't forget get this uh, important part, our SSD choice today. This M.2 drive is also going to go into our motherboard, providing us with some really fast NVMe storage. The Seagate Barracuda 510 is a great kind of entry level M.2 option that still gives you the performance you'd expect from an M.2 drive. Now, regular viewers of the channel will know what's coming next. The teeny tiny screwdriver has returned to remove this M.2 retention screw on our motherboard today. Once we've taken that out, a little something like this, we're just going to line this notch on our M.2 slot with the slot on our motherboard today before fastening that same screw back down. And just like that, the motherboard assembly, as we're going to call it, is actually complete. That wasn't too difficult. Now that brings us nicely on to our case choice today. This is the Cooler Master Master Box MB320. Al. Now, as far as budget cases go, this is about as good as it gets. We've got a mini tempered glass side panel, a power supply shield, as well as a couple of addressable RGB fans at the front. Plus, the chassis is also available in a mesh version if that's more your thing. Now then, installing the motherboard into our case today is not going to be too tricky. Simply locate each of the standoff holes through our motherboard today and make sure that these line up with the corresponding standoffs in our case. Case. In our case today, quite literally, we're all ready to go. Make sure you grab the IO shield from your motherboard's box as you don't want to forget to install this. That's going to snap through the rear of the case with the audio ports at the bottom. And then we can go ahead and just slide the motherboard nicely into place, which you can then secure down with the included motherboard screws, just like so. Next up today, then we could install the graphics card, but I'm going to save the best till last and do our power supply first off. 
This is a 650 watt gold unit from Cooler Master. It's maybe a little bit overkill for today's build, but it never hurts to have a good, reputable, highly efficient, well received power supply. Because this is modular as well, you only plug in the cables you need, which is going to help with our cable management today. In terms of the cables we're going to plug in, a 24 pin motherboard power cable is first, a 4 plus 4 pin CPU power connector is next up, a dual 6 plus 2 pin PCIe power harness for our graphics card is third and finally a few SATA cables for any hard drives we might install later or RGB controllers and that kind of thing it just doesn't hurt to pop it into place. Once they're in we're going to spin the case around so that we can go ahead and screw the power supply itself nicely into place. It's going to slide fan facing down through the rear of the chassis and be screwed down in each corner a little something like this. Okay then now that's nicely into place it makes sense to do a couple of our cables and wires now before we finally, I promise we'll get to it, install our graphics card today. The first is the CPU power connector which goes to the top left of the motherboard, a little something like this. Next up is your 24 pin motherboard power cable, goes to the right hand side of the motherboard and is the biggest cable of the bunch today. HD audio is next up for your headphone and mic jacks on the front of our case, going to the bottom left of the motherboard with a pin blocked out. USB 3 is next, it's the largest of the front panel cables today it's notched so we'll only go in one way don't force it super easy clips in it's a bit cumbersome but it'll be all right talking of cumbersome the last of the front panel cables today is our jfp1 uh, this is for our power reset hard drive indicator leds and that kind of thing i've popped a diagram on your screen to make this easier to follow along with but if you get confused or get them the wrong way around don't worry don't panic uh, nothing's going to explode i hope okay then it's the moment we've all been waiting for the graphics card today this is the new NVIDIA RTX 3060 Ti and I've got to be honest with you from my testing so far with detailed benchmarks later on this is an absolutely insane GPU and actually going to be a better option than this the 3070 for the vast majority of people both ray tracing and rasterization look incredibly good NVIDIA are kind of touting this as a 1080p beast but 1440p at 100 fps and a lot of the latest AAA titles is also more than possible this Founders Edition card looks fantastic. It's very, very similar to the 3070 Founders design, but it's silver rather than kind of a good metal grey and very, very slightly thinner. You've also got NVIDIA's new kind of awkward, but I can see where they're kind of going with this 12 pin mini power connector. But this card isn't particularly power intensive. Eight pins is about what you'd be looking at in traditional power supply terms. But all in all, I'm really excited to get this in, get gaming on it. But so far, I am really, really impressed. Now, installing the graphics card is pretty simple. You need to push back this clip on your motherboard and then basically slide the GPU very nicely into place. Now, of course, NVIDIA do include this uh, little 12 pin to 8 pin power adapter to make sure our GPU gets nice and juiced up. It is going to look, as I say, a little bit ugly, but hopefully if it gets more widely adopted, power suppliers will kind of start including this as standard in the box. We shall see. With that being said, though, all that's really left to do is plug this up to our power supply, do a little bit of cable management today, and then boot this system up to see just how good it looks, but more importantly, how it performs in around 15 of the most popular AAA titles. But first, there's only one thing for it. Roll the montage. Okay then, now we've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up and the process of putting this 3060 Ti gaming PC build together, let's see exactly how it performs. Kicking things off with Death Stranding, a title that of course supports DLSS, and here at 1440p high settings, you're looking at 134 FPS with 121 and 116 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. GTA 5 is next up and it's a similarly positive story. 1440p high settings in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode sees an average of 108 frames per second. Control is next up today, first off at 1440p with DLSS enabled and ray tracing at medium. 85, 78 and 71 are very respectable frame rates here and I also tested at 1080p 
giving me 90, 83, and 77, with the identical settings, RTX at medium, uh, but with DLSS at 720p. Apex Legends is next up, 1440p high settings with the unlimited frame rate uh, configured in Origin, sees 148 FPS on average, with 124 and 117 in the latest Season 7. Call of Duty's Warzone's next, I will of course be testing Cold War in just a second, 1440p high settings sees 128, 91 and 86 FPS respectively. Talking of Call of Duty Cold War, once again at 1440p high settings with ray tracing enabled in the game's stunning campaign mode. And you're looking 70 frames per second on average with 90 and 99th percentile results of 62 and 57 respectively. These numbers will notch up past the 80-85 mark at 1080p, but I think visually the game looks stunning and very playable at 1440p. The Forza Horizon 4 in-game benchmark is next today, 1440p on the Ultra preset, sees 136, 128 and 123 FPS respectively. These notching down to 98, 93 and 88 at the 4K Ultra preset in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. Overwatch is next, 1440p Ultra settings sees 157 FPS on average, with 142 and 136 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Very, very respectable esports level frame rates at 1440p maxed out settings on what is kind of a 2060 super replacement. That is crazy. Talking of crazy, CSGO is what you'd expect, 1440p high settings, sees 297 frames per second. Battlefield 5 is next up today, I did get a playable 1440p experience, but 1080p with ray tracing enabled is where this card is rightfully positioned, especially in a $1000 build. High settings with RTX on and DLSS on sees 83, 70 and 64 FPS respectively. The reason I didn't test some of the other games so far today at 1080p is because the 1440p maxed out numbers are absolutely crazy and your 1080p frame rates are always going to be about 30% higher. Talking of which, Minecraft, that was a weird segue, 1440p with RTX on and an 8 chunk render distance, uh, which is the kind of recommended level for Minecraft RTX, uh, especially while it's still in beta, and you're looking 98, 93, and 89 FPS respectively. Your mileage may vary in Minecraft RTX, and disclaimer, I've had some really weird number disparity. This is technically beating out a 3090 based on my numbers, but I guess that's the joys of Minecraft ray tracing. Next up today is Doom Eternal, a good overall test of rasterization, and here you're looking 162 FPS. FPS on average uh, with a 1440p Ultra Nightmare preset. This is about on par with the 3070 actually at 1440p Ultra Nightmare, which is kind of crazy. Doom once again can provide some varied results, but the gaming experience looked fantastic and was very, very playable indeed. The Rainbow Six Siege inbuilt benchmark is next up. 1440p Ultra sees 161 FPS on average, with 149 and 137 respectively. Uh, this does sit just below uh, the 3070, as you might expect, which is going to edge out by about 30 frames per second. But the biggest margin, actually, between the 60 Ti and the 70 we've seen so far today. Valorant is next up, 1440p high settings, NVIDIA's lag-busting reflex technology enabled. Uh, you're looking 229 FPS with 197 and 183 respectively. Truth be told, this game's probably more tied at those lower resolutions to CPU uh, over GPU, which is where this build is actually doing quite well for the price point. Watch Dogs Legions is next up, a game that frankly looks incredible with ray tracing on. That's really where this technology comes into its own. 1440p, the very high preset with RTX enabled and DLSS enabled as well, uh, gives you 77 FPS on average, with 72 and 69 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. DLSS making those frame rates very achievable at 1440p. For those of you who don't know, it's an AI-based tech that basically renders the game at a slightly lower resolution than your screen's resolution and uses AI to upscale it. NVIDIA have run through loads and loads and, I mean, millions of scenarios 
with games on their supercomputers to kind of determine how to best upscale that title to give you the kind of as close to true 1440p or 4k at resolution as possible. The final title today then is Fortnite and before you keyboard warriors go mental in the comments I have tested it at a range of resolutions including competitive settings so hold out. 4k high settings with RTX disabled and DLSS enabled gives you 198 FPS on average with 147 and 124 respectively. Tuning down to 1440p with RTX off and DLSS enabled once again gives you a kind of 30 FPS boost uh, on average taking you up to 221, 194 and 172. So esports level frame rates here uh, with Fortnite pretty much vanilla but with DLSS enabled. 1440p high with RTX enabled and DLSS enabled takes you down to around about 61, 52 and 46 respectively. And finally then today, 1080p with high settings and RTX enabled. 1080p of course is where Nvidia are positioning this 3060 Ti with my 1440p performance numbers, giving you kind of a worst case scenario, but a very good worst case at that. Brings you down to 82, 75 and 68 uh, over the kind of 200 ish figures you'd see with ray tracing disabled. Once again though, DLSS helping to give us some very playable frame rates here and 82 FPS ain't half bad. All in all, I've been super impressed with this 3060 Ti from Nvidia. When I plugged it in, I genuinely had to check I hadn't installed a 3070. Some of the numbers were just that close and I will of course link my 3070 content in the card section now. If you're a 1080p gamer who dabbles in 1440p, this card is more than good enough. And if you're not a user of ray tracing, I, personally I think you should give it a go, but if you're not, for straight rasterization, this card kills it for the price point. And that's what AMD have got to be concerned about when they come to respond to this. With the 6000 series so far, rasterization has been their claim to fame, AKA the performance when you take ray tracing out the equation. But with this coming quite so close to the 3070 at a price point that should hopefully stay around RRP and be you know, affordable within a $1,000 budget system, this thing is super duper impressive. I'll link all my coverage, this card and all the other components today in the description below though. Thank you very much for watching. Make sure to get subscribed, help us hit that big 100K if you haven't already. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.